Hello and welcome to another episode of Menace to Sobriety with your host Daniel O'Reilly, aka the comedian Dapper Laughs. I've got a really interesting guest today. Last few episodes have been a little bit heavy. Um, there's going to be some heavy parts to this, but also some light to this one. A little bit of fun because uh, I've met this gentleman before. Uh, I was invited onto his podcast and uh, we struck up a bit of a rapport. I started learning a little bit about his journey and I was like, what? What am I doing on your podcast? man you gotta get on my podcast um i'm going to introduce uh lewis raymond taylor he's a british international professional credentialed coaching trainer <laughs> i know it's mental <laughs> he basically um he's like he trains coaches to be coaches he's uh an entrepreneur an actor movie producer and he's best known for founding uh the coaching masters a 25 million dollar uh, coaching Academy, which is the fastest growing coaching company in the world. But aside from that, he's got an absolutely chicken oriental mental story. He's sober. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's slowly becoming a pal of mine. And um, yeah, let me introduce him. This is Lewis Raymond Taylor. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the invitation and the yeah. lovely intro. Yeah, Appreciate man. It. That's all right. So we met. We met recently. Uh, I had to get you on the podcast, man. It was um, it was it was cool. Sort of talking to you on your yours and what was your name of your podcast again it's the turning adversity into an asset yeah so which which was a great chat you know obviously you saw that it went down went down very well oh well, yeah by the way lots of good response yeah. oh really yeah oh that's good yeah <laughs> you never know if you're just waffling on do you no, no, it was really good oh good man um and and then we got talking and then uh, we spoke about how you've got a, a documentary coming out soon we can't say where it where it's going but it's on uh the most popular platform on the planet and it's going to be huge and then I was like why what's it about and then you told me a little bit and I was like you fucking lunatic let's <laughs> yeah. get you on the podcast man but first up it's Menace to Sobriety and you are sober mm -hmm. how long are you sober do you, do you keep track uh, well this is actually something we could start on I don't keep track anymore mm. and it's interesting because just before this you mentioned about days and it yeah. sort of being this thing that builds up and you know yeah. I'm trying not to deep dive too deep into it but I don't count anymore no is that is that because you don't want it to be your identity sort of thing or I think or, it puts pressure on it like I've, I've yeah. had a couple of relapses throughout the time so I couldn't claim the whole it'd be like six seven years now yeah um uh, but I've had a couple of relapses but I found that when I was counting the days yeah yeah it does become a bit about like I'm this sober person with this amount of days and you've got longer and I've got less and it's yeah. like every day is an extra tick yeah. Cock yeah. Clock that's gonna explode yeah and <laughs> yeah. um instead I'm just like I don't drink yeah, that's where I want to get to. Yeah, because I'm getting sick of it a little bit. I'm not know. sober. I'm not, a, you know, I just, just don't yeah, drink. I'm just different now to yeah. how I used to be. Um, mate, you've got some mad story, man. Mm. You've got a crazy, crazy story. I don't want to give any of it away. I want the <laughs> the listeners to... Um, Build up. Yeah, I want the listeners to... I want you to take us on this journey. So first off, who are you? Where did it all begin? Who am I? Fuck uh, me, that's a deep one to yeah, start with. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> do you know what? I can relate a lot to some of the stuff because you was a big troublemaker when you were younger. Yeah. And um, I was too i got expelled and da -da -da. so i can relate to a certain side of it the drink the drugs the cocaine all of that jazz yeah starts from the beginning who are you what happened and okay so you said you didn't want to go too deep but obviously i've got to kind of give let's, a bit no, of context to no, it yeah no no i just I, I, yeah let's, so we'll, let's we'll brush over it and i'll just sort of no 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 it. let's get into it it's all right oh, yeah. so we'll go deeper yeah. right so um from a very young age, I was actually a naughty kid, you know, just a naughty child in general. I'm not sure where yeah. that came from, whether I was always like that or whether it was because of I was brought up in some way that I can't remember. I don't know. Yeah. But like at the age of nurse, at nursery, literally, my mum came in. She told me the story how it was like, bring your, you know, come and ch see your son at nursery day. Mm. Everyone was sitting there cross-legged on the uh, carpet and there's me with a Superman costume on, banging a drum, singing happy birthday to myself. <laughs> just fucking <laughs> mental, crazy. Yeah. Either mental or just fucking doing what I want because, yeah. you know, and I, later on in life, I kind of, I'm quite grateful for the fact that I, I did what I want, you know, yeah. and, I, and I don't want to listen to other people and abide by other people's rules because that's yeah. boring, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, bit maverick, a um, bit disruptive, but was living my own life and expressing myself fully and openly, mm. if you can see it on that side of the coin. Anyway, that's kind of the earliest kind of, story that I've been told of my behaviour. I must have been, I don't know what, four or five or whatever you are at that age. Um, but yeah, naughty kid. Um, mm. Where did it come from initially? It was the need for attention. So yeah. my dad was an alcoholic. 
he'd put me down. He'd, he would hit me a couple of times, but mainly it was the things he'd say. He'd look at me in absolute disgust mm. and be like, you are, you're fuck off, you're a buffoon. He's like, you'll never amount to anything. And he was like six foot, big, scary. Yeah. And I would, I would believe that and I'd internalize that. Um, mm. And that must have happened when I was, you know, at the age of around, I don't know, seven, I can kind of remember being that young. And I remember going upstairs and had this one wardrobe that I'd pull open and there'd be a, there was a mirror in there. There's a mirror on top of a chest of drawers. And I would do it to look at myself and then punch myself in the head as hard as I could because I was just so angry at myself for being this bad kid. Oh, really? So like internalizing all this, you know, all this, all these issues of thinking it's about me. So I, um, being this kind of, kind of crazy, naughty, bad kid started to become more naughty, crazy and bad. Mm. Um, but there was one time where I decided to kind of try and find it in a different way. And although I, you know, I'm consciously aware of it now, I wasn't back then. It's not like I knew I was looking for this attention or this significance, which I was yeah. craving, but I thought, oh, I want to be an actor. That's mm. what I want to do. I don't, I don't quite remember when I realized that, but it was from around that age, around seven or eight, where I was like, I want to be an actor and fair play for my mum and dad. They put me in acting classes and dancing and singing. I do everything. I was in the choir. Yeah. I even did ballet at one point. Like I'm just extreme, like anything you give me. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'll be a fucking ballet and a tap dancer as well then. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> me Not too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was me in the local newspaper being referred to as Billy Elliot and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I went to these. Um, <laughs> yeah, look at me. <laughs> yeah, look, look at me. me. I'm, I'm doing ballet. No one else is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, but that yeah. was the kind of person I was. Always been yeah. like that. Um, you know, I've got pictures of it. It'll come, it'll come up in the dock. I'm literally this tiny little kid with these bro- spiky hair. You know, when it was fashionable, it had the spiky hair and the slick back sides. Hmm. You obviously don't. You're like, mm, no. <laughs> don't no, I did. No, I did. I did. I used to. I, 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 when I remember myself young, I mean, I've got pictures of me as well. We used to straighten the hair. Did you used to do Oh, that, that was when I was blonde, a bit older. Yeah, yeah oh, blonde yeah. highlights. I know you used to straighten the back. Yeah. Straighten the black, back as well. Blonde highlights. At the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spiky. Mate, I had GHDs, mate. I, yeah, I, I had GHDs, yeah. <laughs> I invested in Yeah, them. yeah. Looked like a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of I, I, that, that was a horrible era. No one talks about that. Though. There's no pictures no. of that. It's like deleted no. from everyone's it's memory. Weird, isn't Don't it? bring it up. If, if you walk around like that now, people would think you're identified as a woman. Mate, I used to wear a waistcoat <laughs> and a pink skinny tie or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to have my But I'd ear- still absolutely smash people's heads in, though. It really confused me. Yeah, yeah. I, I had my ear pierced at the top as well. <laughs> I, weird. I had a nose pierced. I had my <laughs> nose pierced as well. <laughs> Mate, it's dysfunctional kids, man. These are the signs you got to look out for, parents. <laughs> yeah, if you get your nose pierced, you are fucked. <laughs> yeah, go on. No, but anyway, no, it was interesting though, because when I was this was when I was older though, because when I was that age, mm. ten, eleven, it was like the spiky hair. But then when I when I was I think I was seventeen, that's when I started having the fringe and stuff. But yeah, I would look like this little you know pretty boy. I think you called yeah. it at the time, but I would still have some crazy scraps that would confuse people. They <laughs> yeah. wouldn't be expected it. I'd start hitting hit them around the back of the head with a brick or something. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, what the fuck? Why that lesbian just hit me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, where, where was I? So, I was doing acting, singing and dancing. Um, went to this stage school. Um, and I was probably about 11 at the time. I'd done some plays. I'd done some bits and bobs. Never anything like fully professional when you're a kid. But mm. done some modelling. Um, did a few bits and pieces. And I went to this stage school that did it on the weekend. And uh, some fella invited me around to his house and, cut a long story short, sexually abused me. Oh, my God. How old were you then? Eleven. Jesus. Yeah. And, and was the fella a teacher or an no, older boy? He was an older boy, but thinking back at now, I just, I don't, yeah, he must have been probably a bit older than I thought. Because I was 11, I must have thought he was 15, but maybe he was 18. Wow. But I don't know whether or not he was just a gay lad yeah. or if he was there to, like, find kids. <laughs> Yeah. Or if he was there because he wanted it to be and he fancied, uh, who knows? Like, I never really found out that. But I just buried that and that was like one of the trauma. Was it, just, I don't want to go into detail, but was it bad? Like, uh, bad? It wasn't as bad as it possibly could be, if that makes sense, but it was in it's the middle. It's still bad, yeah, yeah it's still yeah. bad, but no, but I didn't mean what well, happened. <laughs> what happened? No, I didn't mean Tell what me happened. Tell me the full details. No, no, no. You want to know the details, no, Andy? No, no, no. I you want to get into that? No, I didn't I didn't mean I didn't mean the actual thing that happened. Get what, the buzz off it. It's like, oh, what, what would he do to <laughs> <laughs> No, what I meant is <laughs> fucking making this awkward, man. What I meant is... Uh, was it bad for your mental health at the time? That's what I meant. I mean, like did, when you were that age, did you did did did, did you see a mental health down, downturn then, or was it like that was a bad experience? I don't know what happened there. 
I mean, it's not like I was like, oh my God, I've been sexually abused. I'm traumatized because I didn't even know that I'd been sexually abused. I didn't even know what trauma was. But yeah. of course, it had an effect on me. Yeah. And it was at this stage where I went from second, uh, from primary school to secondary school. Mm. So I went into year seven. Must have confused you a lot. Like. Yeah, because part of me was like, did I did, did, did I do that? Yeah, yeah. Was that something I did? Did I? Did he know that was going to happen the whole time? Yeah, yeah. So I was just like buried it. So yeah, it never of course. Happened. But obviously that has an effect. But then what I did do is I stopped doing all the acting, singing and dancing because of that. So no. that's how it had its effect on me. I was like, I'm going to distance myself from that and block out that. And just anyway, I'm in secondary school now and that's not even cool to do that. Like I can't be pulling out my ballet shoes anytime soon. So yeah. I've got to form a new identity and find this new way of, you know, getting this validation that I was looking for. I now know. Mm. Um, so I just turned into a complete shit, basically. Um, nearly expelled, you know, every year until they finally did expel me. Um I was getting arrested at the age of... I first got arrested at 11 for shoplifting makeup from Superdrug. Not to wear, to but just because all the girls... No, for the girls, you know, get that, Lewis, all right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm a big man, I'll take anything. Did you have a poacher's pocket, like a rip on the inside? No, I'll just right. fucking stick it right in my pocket. I wouldn't even oh, try right. and... You know, I was just... I didn't have me, one I've of them never been strate- <laughs> I've never been strategic. I've never You've been just like, been spontaneous. Like, yeah, I'm just, just showing off. Didn't give a shit. Yeah, get caught, get caught. And... um by 13, I was, uh, I love criminal damage. That was my thing. I just loved smashing things. Like, honestly, my first thing was smashing fences. Well, that was the first time I got arrested for it. And then I, I, I used to love smashing windows. That was weird. Was Did that? you just do a sound effect of a smashing window that, at the like, exact time? That was so weird. What was that? There was a smash window as I said that. And old Bill and please, but they won't hear that because it's oh, it's not on the thing. That's this, a shame. Oh my god! But as soon as I said, it, I used to have a thing for smashing windows. Just went, <laughs> smashed outside. Oh my god! <laughs> but um, yeah, I go think on. it's because it was intense, and it's like you get that immediate shout out. I'd get the bu- yeah. the bus hammer from the back of the bus, you know, the, with the diamond tip. Yeah, and and just go around smashing bus stop windows. One time, I smashed every single bus stop window on a four mile stretch. It took me hours. Yeah, I think, but I, no, but I, I think this is a natural thing for kids' vandalism when they're just fucking and especially showing off with their mates and and like taking it's a way to take it to the extreme. You know, who's going to do something mad? Yeah. Who's going to do something crazy? Yeah, I was on my own though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell! Yeah, you're <laughs> fucked, mate. Yeah. I was, I was with people at the beginning, but then I just, I think I was just, I, I wanted to get caught, and they say neg- even negative attention is attention. You know? Right. Yeah. And I think maybe I was hoping to get arrested, or hopefully, mum and dad would sit me down and go, "What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. What's the matter with you?" Yeah. And I'd, you know, maybe I could actually start to say something. Yeah. But I was, but at home, my mum was like, she provided for me, but very emotionally disconnected didn't really know how to support yeah and talk emotionally my dad was just a fucking i refer to him as a robot he would just drink himself to oblivion and never say anything so hmm. never had any way of understanding myself what no, was going on no outlet for it all yeah. no outlet yeah and there's lots of anger and rage as well and that kind of criminal damage i guess that was a bit of an outlet hmm. so i was expelled from school at 15 obviously i'm drinking i'm taking weed and all that sort of stuff happening at the same time um and then 17 uh, drinking's getting bad and then I found this girlfriend <laughs> found this one <laughs> found her <laughs> no I found a girlfriend yeah. and um, she plugged that sort of void that I felt it was like oh I feel good you know this yeah. is what I've been looking for love wow took me around to her friend her, her friends her family's house and they would invite me around for dinner and sit in front of the TV and laugh and banter with each other and I was like oh my god this is this is what family's like I fucking hell what have yeah. I been having this is not what we do um and then I felt like I'd got something. Mm. And then I got really pissed up one night. I drank a bottle of Jack Daniels. And this is, and my, because my mum drank a lot and my dad was an alcoholic, I didn't actually really have a perception of what a lot of alcohol was. Mm. So at 17, I was already blacking out almost from drinking. Drunk a bottle of Jack Daniels and whiskey was used to send me fucking loopy. Any type of whiskey would send me crazy. Anyway, I don't even know, really remember exactly what happened. Um, but I had an argument with her. Not physical, just verbally. And she turned around and said, well, you know what? I cheated on you. And, oh and it just went. I've never had one of those moments. You know where people talk about those moments where it hits you in the face? Yeah. And you feel like it's an expression. It's not an expression. Like, yeah, the just blood's f- like, it was just, just, It was just like a, I felt rejection. I felt the confirmation that I'm this bad, unlovable uh, kid. I felt the rejection from my, because my, my family also like ring fenced me from the family as well, their words like cut me off from affecting my little brother who I was also getting involved with like drugs and stuff 
so I was sort of rejected by my family and then she'd kind of rejected me and you know been unfaithful and sort of felt all that at once and in the flash I just saw red I didn't see red but that was the expression you know I just saw fucking something went fucking loopy smashing up her kitchen and as I was smashing up her well her mum's kitchen as I was smashing up her mum's kitchen I pulled a drawer out and it all fell to the floor and I saw a six inch kitchen knife and I picked it up and she went Whoosh. didn't even know what I'd done and realised that I'd slit both sides of my throat. As you can see, the scar, if you close up, it's just only light now. Oh, like one's my there, God. And one's like there. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Both sides. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. It's like proper scars. There. Yeah, yeah. Shit. You wouldn't see it unless you unless you obviously... No, I can see, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh and uh, they were, I mean, they're, they're, they're about that long. So when you were a kid, they must have been like that. Yeah, and they were bulbous like that when they after. So it started spurting my blood up. I just literally slipped my throat. And I uh, went downstairs and her friend was there. I was like, Lewis, what have you done? I, you know, passed out. Woke up, the ambulance are there. I started fighting the paramedics. It's loopy. Absolutely loopy. Get oh the fuck God. off me. This is fucking crazy, mate. <laughs> Sorry, can we just hold tight a second? Because you're saying it's in like this one day I'll slip my throat. <laughs> it's like fucking chill out, man. Just let us take this in. So obviously you were drunk though, right? You yeah. were drunk. You were drunk. The rejection. I can relate to the rejection, but you were drunk. And it was, was this like a psychosis or like a, I mean, have they ever looked back on this and sort of said, what, I mean, was it a cry for help or was it a suicide attempt? No idea. Or, or, or it was just like a I rage? Don't think it was suicide. I don't think it was suicide. I think it was self-harm. I think I was just feeling so much like uh, turmoil. I didn't understand. And maybe there was an element of like, Fuck I'm going to show you, you know, you've just done that. Well, look at this. I don't know. Yeah. Some sort of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but I never really figured out. Um, but then the ambulance came and then you... Yeah, ambulance came and then they, uh, they, they eventually um, pinned me down, sedated me, stitched my neck up. There and, and they, what, at the house? No, they took me up oh, right, to, yeah. in the ambulance. And then once I'd calmed, I was screaming, by the way, screaming, crying, let me die, all this sort of stuff, get the fuck off me. Blah, blah, blah. And then... Um, once they, once I'd sort of calmed down, I'd ripped the fucking cannulas out and I ran up to a house, but I was wearing a hospital gown and my neck had just been stitched up and they were like bulbous, you know, when they push skin together to like mm. stitch it. So I had these big like <laughs> stitches <laughs> covered in blood, like literally covered in blood because it was spurting and I <laughs> knocked on her door. Who's? My ex, my girlfriend at the well, time. You went back there. I went back. <laughs> I went pick. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, I'm not done with you. No, I didn't say. But the thing is, I, when when she answered, I didn't really expect for her to answer. I didn't really know what to say, so I just stared at her instead. Can you imagine? <laughs> can, you imagine can you imagine? That's her first boyfriend she ever had, man. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but she's like, yeah, I don't know if I'm yeah, cut yeah. out, but she's probably a lesbian now. <laughs> she might be. Fuck. Never spoke to her since. Um, but what did she do? Just look at you. We were just, I can't remember roughly, but yeah, just sort of staring at each other not knowing what was going to be said next. And then Fuck. I think, yeah. And then I got sectioned under the Mental Health Act. So I actually got sectioned by the police, arrested for being insane. And they took me to St. Albans, Albany Lodge, which is a mental health facility, <laughs> put me in a padded room. <laughs> Shit, you're not. It's cliches as you, as you like. And then I woke up in the morning, sober, <laughs> and they was like, are you all right now? I went, yeah. I went, have you got anyone to pick you up? I went, yeah, my mum. They went, all right then. Just let me go. <laughs> <laughs> And my mum picked me up. She didn't say a fucking word in the car. <laughs> oh my god! Is that for real? Yeah, I swear my life. I thought I thought they'd be like, right, this kid needs he's, help. He's, he's 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 drunk. He's fucking slit his throat. <laughs> he's gone gone to hospital. He's gone back to the house. He might be a risk to her, let alone himself. They put you in a padded cell for one night. Well, a few hours. Yeah, a few hours that, until and I woke said, up. Right, you feeling a little bit better now? You're not going to cut your head off, are you? <laughs> I just sent you out. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they just put it down to our oh, 17-year-old first love again. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. <laughs> Honestly, and I think it was more bizarre that my mum didn't say a word. Oh, she didn't that... know what had happened. She just saw stick stitches out of my neck and was just like, all right. Nah, that is that that that's that's a bit beyond not fucking saying anything. You, should, she, I mean, she just didn't, didn't know how to deal with it. It's like yeah. how she probably wanted to before. What am I going to say? Yeah, your neck looks pretty fucked. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> what you do that for? Yeah, have you cut your neck cut? Cut your neck cut. Looks different. Yeah, um, just barbers, barbers, mum. I'm changing my barbers. <laughs> fucking mental. Um, yeah, but listen, what about your dad? Didn't you? Didn't say a word. So it was never spoke of. No. This like massive cry for help. This almost, almost this. And listen, uh, 
this. I, I know I joke and I always say this to people, but I can relate to so much of your story. I always had this this overriding abandonment issues from my mum and dad breaking up and not seeing my dad and all of this jazz, right? And I never ever managed to maintain relationships when I was younger. And the breakups were unbearable mm. for me. They were unbearable. It's because you, know? you, you lose everything and you realise you're all alone. Yeah. So that did that. All right. Anyway, carry on. Okay. <laughs> what Ooh. next? All right. On episode two. So then I cut my little fingers off. <laughs> no, so what did happen next? So then I went off the fucking walls after that. It was like, it was almost self-destruct, um, suicide mission in a sense, and just started going crazy. It was it was just after that I went to jail for the first time, so I stole a van, had this police chase, literally didn't know how to drive. How, how, did, how, what, how did this come? Was you just sort of getting bored and, and like just, I just didn't have a, lashing out? Didn't have a, didn't have a, didn't have something right. <laughs> it weren't, my head weren't right. That's all I could say. I didn't really realise what I was doing. It was just me. So like, I'll give you an example. The first time I went to jail, <clears throat> walk along the road, see a car key on the floor. Right? Any normal person would probably leave it or maybe hand it in. I just put it in my pocket. And then went up to the pub, got drunk. And then we were going to a friend's house. I couldn't fit. So I was like, hmm, I've got a car key here. Fuck you now. And then I went down to the road, pressed the button, and it beep, beep, it's a van flashed up. <laughs> <laughs> we and um <laughs> Yeah, you're a nut of I know it's not the technical term for it, but yeah. That's fine, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty pretty crazy. Yeah. And um I love it though. I didn't know how to drive as well. I'd never driven a car in my life, but I thought I'd figure it out. So yeah. in put it into second gear and that kind of got me forward. Moving. Oh fucking God. hell. Put put music on, bit of Chris Brown at the time. Fucking hell, I've smashed it. Managing to get myself, you know, to where I need to be. Got in a roundabout, police car there, sirens go on. Turns out the van had been stolen in a burglary. That's why someone had stashed the, key, you know, chucked the key, and um, they started chasing me. So I just put my foot down. But I was in second gear, didn't know how to change gear, so I just, you know, and just went crazy across fields and everything. Ended up smashing it into a parked car. It's cut a long story Fucking short. Hell, got man. caught and then got caught with a bit of weed on me as well. And uh, yeah, got sentenced to three months at a young offenders institution. And in there, it's fucking horrible. I, they put me in Woodhill first of all, double A cat because it was closest to home in Milton Keynes. That's where I was, not where I lived. I lived in uh, just outside Watford, so right. in North London, Hertfordshire. And um, put me in Wood Hill, it was double ACAT, and it was full of like people that are doing like 30 years. What does double murder. ACAT mean? Sorry, It's like mate. the most secure jail you can get. So you get murder, like Charles Bronson's been there, Ian Huntley, that paedophile was in yeah. there. Not in my wing. But um, yeah, yeah. But it's people with serious crimes, and they put you in there, and then they then decide where you're going to get categorised, and they put you off. But I was in prison with, the, with all these gang lem- members and murderers. I remember there was a three kids from Liverpool that got uh, sent down. It was in the newspaper. You would have seen it at the time. They kicked some old man to death f- f- uh, that was riding his push bike, and they stamped on him so hard they stamped through his helmet and killed him. And he was like a 70 year old man for a fiver. These are the sorts of people I'm knocking about with. Fucking hell. Like dirty people, but when you first got in there, how <coughs> did you how did you change how did you sort of adapt to it? Did you create another persona? Uh yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had to really. Because if you if you don't, you're gonna get absolutely fucked over. Literally. <laughs> no, 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 not literally. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't happen in younger vendors. But um Yeah. You're gonna get taken advantage of, so you've got to yeah, stand your ground. I did have a couple of scraps in there. Um luckily not too far because it can get fucking horrible in there. People throwing sugar, you know, melted sugar in a t- in a kettle yeah. over your face and hitting you over the head with a load of tuna cans in socks and stuff like that in the morning, first thing when the doors open. But yeah, there was this one guy who was a daddy of the wing, eighteen years old from Wales. And um, he had 30 years, got sentenced to 30 years. And, um, what was it for? Well, it was, well that's what I've had. Yeah, so supposedly killing a couple of blokes or whatever. Of course, that's what you would have said. But when I got out, Googled his name, and it turned out he was homeless. And this midwife that had served for like 40 years, she was like well known in the community. She was like 60 years, 70 years old, 65 or something, um, had basically seen him on the street and said, Do you want to stay at mine tonight? And he, she took him off the street and gave him a bed. And in the middle of the night, he started robbing a house. She heard him. She caught him. So he stabbed her 30 times to death. Fucking wanker. <sighs> and then this is the guy I'm playing pool with and having a shower with. Uh, so anyway, young offenders, not fun. Everyone wants everyone wants to prove how big and tough they are. And they've got no idea about consequences. You know, if they say you're getting 20 years, just so what? It's almost good. Mm. First thing anyone ever says to you is what are you in for? 
and that's like going to decide what ranking you get you know and the bigger the crime the better so yeah. Yeah, that fucked me up a little bit because when I got out, I was, like, I was only in there for three months. Fuck me, what can I do next? You know, and I was like, I'm going to step this up a bit because my belief system had been warped. You know, spending time with all these people to the point where I was—they thinking, were your peers. Yeah, and that was success. Success was bigger crime. So when I was getting out, I was kind of in the back of my head thinking, well, that was actually all right. That was the worst thing you could ever do to me. And, and it was weren't that bad. It was yes, yeah. It, I enjoyed parts of it. A bit of a buzz. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not quite slitting your own throat, but I mean, exactly yeah. close to. But fuck me, mate. Yeah. So you're out. So how old, <coughs> how old are you now? So now I'm 18 and 19. Went in twice. <coughs> okay. Because they gave me um. Oh, well, I breached my probation. So you you come out on license, and then if you, if you breach that, you go back in. I didn't do anything, so yeah, just put me back in. So I did a couple of times. That took me to 19, and then I just started becoming like crazy violent. So I remember there was this one time where. I didn't actually used to stick up for myself a lot of the time. When my dad used to hit me, I used to freeze. You know, fight, flight or freeze, you've probably heard of it. And when my dad used to hit me, I used to freeze. And I used to think, I can't hit you because I, li I love you and I don't want to hurt you. So I would just be like paralyzed. And I used to be a cocky kid. And I, was, but I wasn't I was actually violent when I was a teenager up until later years. And I'd actually let people jump me. So I would I would be like, go up to some geese or something and say, you're a fucking cunt or whatever. And then I just let four of their mates kick the shit out of me. And then once I'd finished, I'd just sort of stand up and just sort of brush myself off and then just walk back to my mates or whatever. I'd never just swing, I'd never swing back. A bit weird, really. Because I was in that sort of freeze, kind of didn't know how to fight back. But but you wanted to fight, but you couldn't. Yeah, I, I kind of get that. When I was younger, I used to get beaten up a lot. Yeah. And I never used to really fight until a bit later on. Yeah. But but it was it's like you you wanted to do it you was up for it but then in the moment it yeah. didn't come yeah. yeah and I had some scuffles in prison and I had to fight back because if I didn't I was you know I'd get could have got really up yeah exactly they'd be like right that's one on the list we'll go and nick everything he's got on his canteen list so um, when I came out of jail <clears throat> I had this different mindset of just like you know, I'm yeah. strong I've been around fucking real scary people you know this little this little geezer in a fucking with his, with his hair spiky and his, yeah, yeah. And, and his pink skinny tie is no longer going to fucking be yeah. worrying me in the slightest anyway and I remember this guy who jumped me so he jumped me at this party about six months ago and I see him and I went up to him and I didn't even think and my arm just lifted up and just punched him in the face didn't even think about it just happened and then we went into this fight and I beat him up and then the bouncers kicked me out and I just was like, yeah, yeah. I'm powerful. Yeah. And oh. I'd won. I was like, oh yes, this feels amazing. And it, give, it gave me that thing I've been looking for my whole life, the significance, the power. You know, of course I, I knew, I know now I was looking for love. <laughs> just wanted dad to love me. But back then you don't know that. You just feel like, I feel like shit. And yeah, you and do also anything you can you've been getting it and stood on so long. You wanted to stay. You, know, you yeah. felt better to be the other person. Yeah, but like you say, obviously, what you really wanted was your dad. I love it, but I yeah. mean, at, at the time, you're just like, well, this is better than the the alternative. Which and it's is, not even that. It's just, oh, hang on a minute, that felt good. I'll do more of that then. Yeah, you don't have any conscious awareness. Oh, chest is coming. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> stereotype. Look, I'm gonna get chinned <laughs> over it. Um, so, um, mate, I, after that, it was bad. Like I was, um. I got addicted to violence. I know that sounds crazy, but I got addicted to violence. It gave me that fix. It filled that void. And I also loved the notorious nature of what- The image. Yeah, yeah like I love people going, oh, do you hear what Lewis did last night? Or, or Lewis is here and I get, people will be giving me the eyeball and they're a bit worried. I was like, oh, feeding me. Yeah. Um, and I remember, I know it's really bad to say, but just to put, you know, to, to get you into my mind, there, there was this one fight that I had where I, there was a group of lads, just me and a group of lads, jumped behind the bar, opened up the fridge, picked up two bottles and then ran into the, the group, started bottling people. Fucking hell. And then after that, people started referring to that as a Lewis Taylor, because this was before I used my middle name. I changed my, I changed my name in a sense. Mm. To Lewis Raymond Taylor. People people would say, oh, I can now, I almost had to do a Lewis Taylor. And then <laughs> when, I, when I heard about that, I was like, all right. But inside I was like, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's mine. Yeah, fucking oh, hell, mate. I'm the one that bottles people. Mate. And, um... <laughs> I get it though It's the weird thing I get it I went through phases like that And my, I had powers like that That just yeah. thrived on fighting Yeah mm. Not and phases like that But I mean yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I did get arrested for GBH For bottling someone um, And then uh, Four other GBHs And you know Mate I'd, I'd, I'd I know it sounds awful But just I just I want to get to the, the It's honest right it's, But I used to stamp on people's heads I, I had no problem with that 
like it just I wasn't a straight up fighting geezer I wasn't one of those people that's like right let's, let's see who's going to be the best fighter I was just like I'm going to I'm going to hurt you yeah. and I'm not going to stop does it I'd make scare you my friends does it make you feel bad looking back on it now because you could have killed someone right that's a really interesting interesting question um, and something we'll have to dive into um, but I do struggle to find those feelings yeah. what of regret I don't regret any of that because it, obviously I wouldn't have learned and I wouldn't be what, what I mean, in terms what, of remorse you, you don't I you consciously know it I can look back and say I wish I'd never done that they didn't deserve it and it's bad but on a, but a genuine a level felt you sense level um, I didn't know what that was so how could I ever how yeah. could I ever connect that to that? You know, I'd never expressed my emotions. I've never felt them. I'd never learned to nurture. But now, do you have remorse or not? Um, or would it be kind of falsifying it because it wasn't there then? Yeah, exactly. It's a very complex thing. I mean, I, I can't say immediately yes. Yeah. You know, I could tell you yes easily. You know, yeah. but and that'd be the right thing to say to keep everyone happy. Mm. It wouldn't be the truth. Well, I think I think that I think that's a very honest response because most people that you know that go through that go i mean I, i'm pretty sure that a lot of these situations you weren't going out and randomly attacking people like a psycho a lot of these situations no. would have been altercations that have accelerated and ultimately you were fed up of people taking advantage of you but you pushed it too far but you can't falsify emotions like you mm. can't say well no you know i harbor a lot of regret for something that you don't you know well uh, this this is a good opportunity to get into this so um when i during all this i was you know at one point i was looking at eight years in jail for all these offenses um, that's what my lawyer said. And I went to a pre-sentence report and a pre-sentence report is where you go to probation and they like ask you questions, get to know a little bit about you so they can understand what you're like and your family dynamic and who you are so they can recommend, you know, a, a bit more of an informed decision to the judge on the day when they send you your sentence. So the right. judge isn't just guessing and they can take things into account. Yeah. Everyone in the criminal system knows that you're on your best behavior in this place because this is your chance to maybe turn a bit of water works on or mm -hmm. share some trauma and maybe get some favorable words that's going to you know help you maybe not go to jail at all or at least get a lesser sentence me complete opposite i'm going in there like late sitting there like going in what the fuck do you want and um they said do you not care that you're going to prison for eight years I was like no and i didn't I genuinely didn't had no understanding of repercussions, what that effect that might have on me later on. I just didn't, just wasn't there. Um, do you not care about what you've done to these people? No, didn't, wasn't there. You know, it's not like I'd, I, I actually was, I was never happy about it. I'd never got any thrill. Well, I did get a thrill out of it, but not by doing it. Mm. I didn't want that person to be hurt or anything like that. It's not like I'm this like crazy fucking serial killer that just like thrives on other people's pain. That wasn't there, but it was just void. It was just numb yeah. throughout the years of trauma and throughout, or it's either through trauma or just through never learning to actually understand what those things are. Yeah. You have to be taught, you know, this is what this is, this is what that is, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. But if that doesn't happen, you know, you, my emotional intelligence was zero. Yeah. You know, I was emotionally unintelligent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was emotionally thick. And um, I just said, no, 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 I don't. You know, because I've always just been very matter of fact about things. Um, painfully honest, I guess. Yeah. And um, she sent me for a psychiatric assessment and I just thought that was a part of it. But I can understand why, because you're lacking empathy and yeah. you're and uh, and uh, lacking uh, remorse, understanding. These are classic signs of psychotic behaviour, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, but I didn't know that. Yeah, um, I just thought, oh, I'm just getting pissed up with my mates and a couple of blokes there, so I've yeah. just done them in, you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, I've done some time in jail, and if I do a bit more, so what? Mm. Didn't think about, oh, but what about when I'm what about when I'm married when I'm 33 and I'm married to a w woman from America and I won't let me in? You know, like yeah. now. <laughs> like now, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so um, sent me for a psychiatric assessment, Dr. Sadler, and uh, he, he did his report and I was expecting him to just, just come back and just say just a little shit and nothing wrong with him. But they actually diagnosed me with an antisocial personality disorder. Googled it, psychopath. That's what it was. Oh, well, right. So I'm a diagnosed psychopath there. Fucking hell, mate. <laughs> Fuck me. You could have told me this before you came in. <laughs> mate, just fucking tell me at the beginning, man. I should be tooled up or something. Yeah. <laughs> mate, I, do you know what the mad thing is? I, I kind of, I was hinting, I was saying that. I was saying, is this why? Mm. That's why I asked you a minute ago. I said, like, did you not regret it? And then you were like, well, I can't find the feelings there. Mm. Now you can't lie. So, and... 
Man, that's so interesting. So they di- so you are a diagnosed psychopath. Mm. Bear in mind, though, this was 15 years ago. And, you know, and I've done a lot of work on myself. And I have actually since <clears throat> gone back to, to mental health services and been reassessed. And they've said there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. So there is always this question. Was I born a psychopath? Was it a product of my trauma and my upbringing or my mm. lack of emotional nurturing? Was it uh, a due... Was it due to just my my behaviour and yeah. and s- situationally and circumstantially it looked as though I was one, or is there still a bit of resonance there now and I've used to channel it into a more productive area, or am I just an out and out psycho that's doing anything I can to profit and gain? <laughs> <laughs> when you say it like that, I think it's the latter, man. <laughs> like, uh, some would say that some would say it is, or some would say it's a mixture of it all. Oh, yeah, or, I, I or couldn't you, answer it. Well, you go to the doctors and <clears throat> you are also an I actor. Tell you what, I don't tell people that. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. But I tell you, tell you what makes me think that I maybe might not be, is if I was an out and out psychopath, you wouldn't know about it. Yeah. Because I'd be so cunning and baffling and manipulative, mm. and charming, and that you that I wouldn't expose it because that I mean, would be a weakness. <clears throat> but I mean, like now, do you have empathy towards when you do things have, wrong? Yeah. yeah I have. I have empathy. I have, but I, but they're just shallow. That my yeah. emotions are still shallow. I'm still working on them. In, in comparison to most people's, it's a spectrum, right? You've got psychopathy, which is, or psychopathy, sorry, which is on one end of the spectrum can be zero emotion, and they can sometimes be stereotyped as the ones that end up being serial killers and stuff like that. Yeah. But they can also be leaders of society and presidents and things like that because they can make decisions to go to war like that, you know, without emotional Fucking hell, yeah. getting in the way. 1% of the population are psychopaths. Proven for a fact. And then you've got empaths people on the other end of the spectrum that feel mm. everything. They, he- they hear someone's story about trauma, they're crying because they're absorbing it and they can't help but be consumed by it. And these people sometimes can't make logical decisions because they're clouded by all the emotion that's in their way to the point where they're paralyzed with fear and rejection, embarrassment, disappointment, and they're just stuck. Fucking hell, this is crazy. And then you've got people in the middle, which are just normal people that can express their emotions and they can also be logical and they can also feel empathy <sighs> and stuff like that. F- I'm just quite close on the psychopath end. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the truth. I think you're down there with my missus, my wife, <laughs> mate. She's fucking down there. Do, do, do you watch um, documentaries on people killing each other all the time? Or sort of like yeah. serial killers? Yeah, yeah, she does too. She makes notes. Do you know why? It makes me feel better about myself. I'm like, that person is really fucked up, so yeah. I'm not too bad. It's like why I watch Jeremy <laughs> Carl. <laughs> <laughs> or used to. Um, I think I'm definitely on. I don't know if I'm on the empath or empath side of it, but I get, I get drawn in my emotions. I always cry on this podcast. But um, all right, that's really interesting, man. And um, uh, wow, I mean, it sets the stage for your future. I mean, your for for what you how you've turned your mm. life around. I mean, I mean, it's gob it's it's jaw dropping. Mm. But I always, I mean, your podcast is called Turning Diversity into uh, um, Adversity. Adversity into an asset. Yeah. An asset. Turning something shit into something good. Yeah. Which, which with the right mindset, and it's something that I live by myself personally. I've done a video on it the other day, obviously, because I just like posting videos about myself. We spoke about that briefly <laughs> outside, yeah. But no, I've done a video on it the other day where I was very much like, you know, uh, the best thing about what you go through is it's, it's fucking amazing feel to, to be uh, successful. And also, your story can help others, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's a massive key thing to it. But I got to the point where after I got cancelled, I, I fucking... You know, once I got over it, everything and I realised I was at rock bottom and I had to start again, I suddenly realised I was like, oh, wicked, man, because I'm like, I'm like this guy that's got fuck all that can get it all back. And also, like, when the door's shut or people say no, I can be like, look, you know, it took only to myself. They're trying to keep you down. It was mm-hmm. like fucking motivation. Yeah. So tell us, talk us through what happened next, man. So I'll try and summarise a few of the other bits because we could get deep into uh, a lot of other bits as well. I think we're good for time. What are yeah. we on? How long we got left, mate? Yeah, wicked, man. Come on, this okay. is a but, fucking good story. We, this should be a documentary. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is half away because obviously we got then like post all the shit into all the good stuff. Go on. But yeah, go uh, on. let me just quickly just round up the bad stuff. So um, another trauma happened is my dad got pancreatic cancer from the drinking and then ended up walking in finding him da- dead. Oh my god! So was that, this this after you'd been diagnosed and you didn't? Yeah, yeah. Did you go down to prison though when they diagnosed you as a psychopath? No, 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 no. All oh, right, so you got off of all that stuff. Oh no, sorry. Yeah. So what happened with that one is I managed to get uh, another girlfriend and keep myself out of trouble for two years whilst I was on trial. And I uh, started a business called Hype Events, which was selling bouncy castles. Yeah, so I was renting out bouncy castles. Fucking psycho! <laughs> <laughs> go on, bouncing it. There, yeah. <laughs> and um. 
<laughs> but it was all just a front, to be honest, to just to just to show some form of rehabilitation. Mm. Um, and two years later, I ended up getting like, the largest community order you could possibly. Well, my solicitor also dropped a lot of my charges down to ABHs rather than GBHs and things like that. And um, I managed to get 250 hours community service, £3,200 fine, couldn't be drunk in a public place for 18 months, six months tag, two years suspended sentence, something else. It was like the largest you could possibly get. Fuck. Um, so I didn't go down for that. Um, <coughs> and then, yeah, during that time, I found my dad. Um, Shit. De de dead. And also, throughout this time, I forgot to mention I was selling drugs. I was selling coke. Um, and I was doing a lot of coke. Um, and also a lot of meow. I don't know if you remember the meow meow days. Yeah, yeah Methadrone. Yeah, that was uh, at one point my drug of choice for a long time. And that was four days in a room without eating, without drinking water, without sleeping, just just being a drug addict, you know. And that that was shit. Um, the, the cocaine. How did that affect your fucking psychotic? Like, that was part impulses? of it. Really, because I was doing it since I was eighteen, so it was actually part of it. Part of it all, you know. When I was drinking alcohol and taking coke, and then had this like rage, and also this need for power and that, lack of empathy. That yeah, that combination is is dangerous, obviously, and that's what happened. Um, and it was around that time you walked in, and, yeah. and, and your father had passed away at your home. No, so he was even well. I don't know if it's even worse or not, but he he was sick, loads of blood. He went to the hospital. We visited him, and then the next day we went back to visit him. And um, there's like, oh, he's on the he's that one in that room. And I walked in, walked into the room, and he was just there, dead, mouth open, yellow. They forgot to tell me. They didn't realise we didn't know. <laughs> they thought we were coming to visit him um, to to see how he was. No, oh to see God. him dead, but actually, you know, they didn't tell I'm us. Sorry. Man. But but I just just got on the coke again, got on the alcohol, and that was it. Um, and also, like, I've had some sort of crazy fun times throughout this that were also completely reckless. Like I I went and worked abroad for a couple of years in Magaluf for Nine Apple. I was the craziest one. I had fights with like, honestly like Cypriot mafia and all sorts of stuff, and it was crazy. I've had my jaw broken. I've been slashed in the back with a knife. I've had teeth knocked out. Every fucking day, I had a different injury. Um, I was just running into groups of people just looking to be battered. You know, I kind of enjoyed that thing. Fuck's sake, man. I was like, I was swinging from balconies sometimes, like, and if I fell, I would die. Like, it was, you know, 10 stories high, and I was underneath, you know, swinging between balcony just because everyone's like, ah, look at Louis. And I was like, oh, yeah. So I was, I was completely gone. Um, and so then I came. After your father passed away? Yeah. And that, that sort of kept me going for a couple of years and I was sort of justifying that behaviour because I was abroad and it was kind of embraced. Yeah. Then I came back. Um, I took myself to the mental place and I was like, I'm fucked up. What's going on with me? And they diagnosed me with bipolar. Fuck me. <laughs> Type 2. <laughs> gave me antipsychotic medication. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, that's another one. Add to the list. But 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 are you? Because I thought I was bipolar. But once I cut the drink and the drugs yeah, out, not bipolar. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it, it's, it's easy to look like you. Yeah, because they're diagnosing you with this. But what you're describing is highs and lows from come downs. And yeah. you know why? I'm, why on one day am I happy and the next day am I fucked? Or, or when it, yeah, when it, and what, if they just said, have you sniffed any cocaine during that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then they put that down to a, you can also be bipolar and take drugs. So that's why it's a yes, yeah, so such a grey area. It's difficult to know what what the chicken and the egg scenario is yeah. you know but we're not educated enough just sorry to interrupt you but we're not educated enough as lads as, as young adults growing up mm. to even associate mental health problems with drug use and alcohol no, it just no. it just like it's fucking mad i'm like nearly 40 years old it's only been this last two three years that i've gone oh maybe because i'm sniffing gear every weekend that might have something to do with the fact that i'm pissed off during the week yeah 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 it's mental isn't it because it's so normal isn't it and yeah. for people that don't take drugs listen to this or drink which is probably unlikely <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe there's a couple they they might not realize that how big that circle is because you're not in it but when you're in it it's like every, everyone i actually once i remember i had a belief that every single person on the world did it because i'd never met i'd never met someone that didn't well my wife um, i've got on it with a copper before yeah i may I, I, well yeah i was gonna say my wife don't and there's a few other people that i know are quite close to me well i don't know hand i don't know mm. <laughs> i know one i know two people <laughs> i think <laughs> i think two or three people and yeah look here's here's a first for the podcast i have been in a i have been in a riot van going around clapham common with the things going off 
sniffing a line off a copper's badge before. <laughs> that's a first for the podcast. Yeah. You can have that. And that's crazy. And yeah. it's the truth. Like, <laughs> I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah, they I fucking get bang true. on it. Everyone does. Oh, don't research who my friends are that are in the police force, please. <laughs> <laughs> or do fuck it, let them burn <laughs> for what they did to me. <laughs> <laughs> it switches like that. It's so scary. Oh, mate. Um, um, anyway, so um, the final moment was I was in a taxi queue. And I was 24 years old at this point. And at this point, I realized I, had a, I was an alcoholic, actually, because I came back from all these years abroad, and I realized I couldn't actually function without a drink. I didn't realize before, because I thought I was choosing to do it. But then I was like, fuck, I actually can't. I need a drink now. And when I drink, I black out. And I'd be like, fuck, what the fuck have I done? Yeah. And then I, I didn't actually realize I was probably an alcoholic, but I knew that I had a serious drinking problem. It was obvious that way, but I didn't really accept it. And um, I went out on a night out, and I was in a taxi queue. And then some guy started... Um, like shouting at me, and I say that I don't think he was probably he might have grabbed, grabbed, grabbed me by the scruff, but if sort of that was what, how it felt. And this is the genuine truth when I think back to that guy, I don't know what he looks like because all I can see is my dad's face, and I know that he must have triggered me, it's no excuse, but it's what happened. And I hit him, and he hit his head on the ground. And then I looked over him, and there was this slow, dark trickle of blood coming out of his head. And I thought I'd killed him, so I thought that's me done. Looked up to my left, oh, CCTV camera. Hands up, put my coat over him. Literally thought he was dead, so I put my coat over him as if he was a dead corpse and just stood there for the um, the police to arrive. Fuck. And then they arrested me, stuck me in the back of the car, everyone's crowding around. Um, and then they didn't tell me if he was dead or not, I kept on asking, they didn't tell me, didn't tell me. And then, um, yeah, it turns out he, he didn't die, but he was in a coma for three days and he had a brain hemorrhage. And um, they sent me to prison. This time it was an adult prison, obviously, because I'm not in young offenders anymore. 21 and over is um, mm. is adult. And uh, they said you would have got three years, but because you pleaded guilty at the scene, which is very rare, I'm going to give you half off, which was actually a, you know, a really good result. And I got 18 months in prison. Um, <laughs> and that, that was the turning point for me because not only had I done that, not only was I you know, nearly taken someone else's life, not only had I nearly lost my own life for you know potentially doing years and years in jail, but I also rung up my mate in jail and I said, what are people saying about me? Because I still had that buzz about, you know, what are people saying, you know? And he said, well, there's a pit, you're on the front page of the newspaper, boorish and violent. Didn't even know what boorish meant, but apparently it's a pig. Um, boorish and violent, paralytic man, troubled teen, all these things, not troubled teen, but there was like tr troubled something or other. And they exposed like I had, at this point I had 19 offenses as well, um, of being arrested for various different things and painted me out to be this obviously lunatic, which I was. I was like, whatever. And then I said, what else are they saying? I said, oh, your friend Charlie has posted a picture of you on Facebook the day you was at court. One of you outside the courtroom and another one of you outside the exact same courtroom seven years before with the caption above it, nothing changes. And that was it. Oh, it hit me again. It was like, first of all, it was a bit like, well, you know, what the fuck do you mean nothing changes? Because he was just as bad as me. It's a bit cheeky of him to say that, but then I was like, actually, he's right. I was, I was literally the same suit <laughs> outside the same courtroom. And then I realized nothing has changed, and I'm back in jail. Um, and I realized I've been doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. And if you've heard that saying before yeah. by Einstein, I think it is. And do you know what? It's crazy because it's just so obvious. But I went, and this is what I did I went back to my cell, and they have these mirrors. And they're not actually mirrors, they're just pieces of metal which you can just get a bit of a reflection on. And I looked into the mirror and I looked at myself. And for the first time in my life, I realized that I was the problem. And I know that sounds crazy because of course it was, but honestly, I was blaming everything and everyone around me and I was never looking at me. And I thought if I could maybe make changes, it wouldn't be to me, it'd be to my life and things that I do, not who I was. And when he said nothing changes, I was kind of like, I haven't changed. And I realized, oh my God, I need to change. You know, and anyone who's got any sort of tiny bit of sense in their brain knows, that, yeah, if you're fucking up, you need to change yourself. I actually never thought of it, not well, once. We don't as men. We don't. Yeah. It takes rock bottom to yeah. for us to even have that conversation. And the moment I realised I was the problem, I was like, fuck, I'm also the solution. As cliche as that sounds, you know, I can actually, I can I, if I can change this, then I'll change my life. And mm. I got a bit excited by that as well, because I'm also obviously very impulsive. I was yeah. addicted to gambling, addicted to sex, addicted to dr drugs and cigarettes and alcohol. Everything you get your hands on, violence, everything you get your hands on, I got addicted to. And luckily, I, I sort of... I 
got a thought about this obsession to change my life. I was like, I could change my name. I could move abroad. I could reinvent myself. And I just got obsessed with the idea of I'm going to change everything about myself. I made the decision right there and then I was going to leave Lewis Taylor behind and I was going to become Lewis Raymond Taylor, which is my dad's name, weirdly. Mm. Um, that is interesting. <laughs> and Lewis Raymond Taylor moving forward and it felt so different. I was like, oh, Lewis Raymond Taylor. There's nothing attached to that in my mind, in that identity. Lewis Taylor, it's what Lewis Taylor did last night. Can you remember what Lewis Taylor did? Lewis Taylor did this, that, and yeah. It felt completely different and it felt light and I sort of see, saw the way forward. And I started to just get myself into a routine, go to the gym, and then I realized the amount of resources that were available in jail. There was a six-week rehab program that I did. There was psychiatry. There was the gym. There was um, uh, counseling. There was um, the library. Um, there was education. Did maths and English in there. Started from scratch. And slowly but surely started to see the changes. I was like, oh, fucking hell, this stuff works. You know, especially in that rehab thing that it, it was called Wrapped Rehabilitation of Addicted Prisoners Trust. Six weeks program, bare basics. The first thing they did, room full of criminals in a circle, and they just asked us, how, how are you? And every single person would say, I'm all right. Next person, I'm all right. Next person, I'm all right. And then every now and again, you get, I'm hungry. <laughs> and then the next person I'm alright yeah. we didn't know how we felt and then they give us a sheet had a list of emotions on there and it was like I guess I am a little frustrated and hungry Yeah, yeah. and um, anyway it was rock bottom personal development but I saw the benefit of it I was like oh my god this can actually help me this can, this can help and I did engage in it and then there was a guy that came around that spoke about a rehab program and at the same time, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, rehab. Hmm. But I think I'm probably changing enough. You know, I've been in here for you know a while now, and I think I'm making some big changes. But during this, I was doing my maths and English exam. And they do exams in jail, real qualifications to help you know, get yourself off the ground. And I got so scared of the exam that I punched a wall. Doesn't make sense, does it? Why are you scared of an exam? And it's because I was scared of proving my dad right. Am I going to be the buffoon, the stupid idiot that he thought I was? And that gave me a real understanding of what I was really scared of, and you know. And but they took me to there was no in-house hospital like they have in the films. They have to take you to the hospital, so they took me in a taxi. Like prison officers are handcuffed either side. I love that, by the way. Everyone looking at me and staring <laughs> yeah, at me. Oh yeah, I am a criminal. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm in prison. <laughs> saw one girl that I knew from the era as well, and I was like, yes. Mm. Like she saw me. She's gonna tell everyone. Mm. So obviously it wasn't changed. But anyway, when I was going through the through the because they resettle you in a different jail closest to your home so your family can visit you. So I was actually only like 20 minutes away from where I lived at this point mm. in the Mount. Um, yeah, HMP the Mount. And um, I have drove, drove, <laughs> drove past where I was from and saw all my old pubs and everything. And I just felt like this wash, this wave come over me <laughs> as if no changes had been happened, as if like that was one life that I was looking to change and this was another life. And I just snapped straight back into the old one. And I realized then I've made no changes. Like I, I, I thought I, had, I hadn't. So I, I went and I applied for that rehab program. And it was six months. And they picked me up from the, reha from the prison gate the day I was released. And they took me, put me into a car and they took me straight to six wow. months rehab. So, instead, so, so, so I'm, I'm just unconscious. We, we, what time we got to? We got to like 1.30, didn't we? Yeah, 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 yeah we got loads of time. Okay, okay brilliant. cool. We got loads of time. Um, yeah, so that's, that, 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 that's fucking brilliant, right? Because what I love, so most people would be like, I want to get out and I want to get back to my friends. I want to get out. I want to get back to drinking. I want to get out. I want to get back. I just want to get back and I want to prove everyone that I'm changed. Yeah, yeah. I, like kind of. Even I'm gonna have. I won't drink that much vodka anymore, and I'll have only a couple of lines, but not a full bag. And I'll have a drink of water between each vodka. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. But not not just that. It's like there's there's so, so many different levels. I'm, I'm only just getting to it myself, like or not even getting to it. But like I've got my own personal realization of my ego at the moment. I'm like I've just fucking because I thought I thought a few months ago I was changed. You mm. know, I thought I was changed, but. It's not, I, but you, but for you to have that personal insight into yourself to be like, I can either go back and pretend that I've changed, yeah, you know, and and sort of, but I deep down I know I haven't, and I'm going to fall into it. And to have that much sort of self awareness to go, I don't even want to go back. I need to stay out of this environment until I've changed. Mm. 
That's and I never went back. Never been back since. So what happened? So you got picked up and you. So went... they took me to Portsmouth, the right, right down on the coast. Um, it was a twenty grand treatment centre that I got for free. I had to apply, apply for this grant. I was kind of expecting them to reject it, you know, because I was still in denial. I'm thinking, why are they going to let me someone like me go in there? There's plenty of people that are more deserving of this spot. But then I got accepted, and I was like, oh, so you must think I need this? Yeah. That was the f- one of the first realizations, and then they took me to this treatment centre, and I'll tell you what was worse than jail. Because it, because it's you live in there, it's like Big Brother. Um, it's like, did you do Big Brother? I did, man. Yeah, so you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like that, but actually worse. It's full of uh, crack and heroin addicts that are fucked up. You know, not, so not Big Brother, that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. yeah go on. not the fact that they were fucked up because they were crack and heroin addicts, but yeah, they, the people were fucked up, and they were obviously all, you know, yeah. You know, some of them have come straight off the street. I'd, I'd come from jail. You got people that come from the street. You know, it's just chaos in there but the worst <coughs> part of it mm. was i thought they were going to teach me how to not drink and not take drugs i thought it was a lesson on how to control my addiction yeah they didn't mention it once hardly once in six months did they talk about alcohol or drugs mm. what they what they spoke about was me yeah. and why i felt the need to have drink and drugs and why i was trying to find an external substance to fix an internal problem and what was wrong with me in the first place and they broke me down so that they could rebuild me back up and it was fucking horrible and there was this one time i mean it start, i started off defiantly i was like ah because even now you know i'd put myself in this situation but i was still so my thinking was so warped i was like i don't know uh, none of you fucking care about me i think my own fucking dad don't love me why the fuck are you gonna give a shit you're just here because you get paid yeah and that was what i be- believed as well I'm, I'm not like these other people looking for any reason to detach myself like oh look at his trainers i never fucking wear them not like him shouldn't be here yeah um and someone said to me mate try and look for the similarities and not for the differences mm. oh, okay that's a good start so i was all right try and be a little bit more open to this but then I was in a group therapy session and I was sitting there with my arms crossed and I was convinced that they were trying to brainwash me because they would, it was, some of it was like really fucking horrible Heavy. here. And I was like, oh God. And I was like looking at these counselors thinking, fucking hell, I don't even know if I want to be like you. I think I prefer my ad. Yeah. Um, in a weird way. Because I, I didn't like normality. That scared me. The, 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 the idea of being normal and being average, yeah. I'd actually r- rather have a really shit shit life Oops, yeah, sorry about that that's right, yeah. i'd rather have a really shit fucked up life as long as i was in control of it yeah but having this sort of mediocre life scared me so i had so i have got this black and white thinking that's yeah. quite destructive and that, that's what a lot of addicts have as well which is why they're kind of all or nothing they can't have moderation it's kind of i'm gonna fucking get annihilated or i'm gonna be sober you know yeah. and that middle ground isn't possible because you just end up swinging to the other side mm. um so anyway, I thought they were going to brainwash me. So I, so I thought, so I thought I'd tell them. I'm going to tell them. So I said, I know what you're trying to do, and I'm doing this in front of all the other people that are in rehab, trying to ruin their experience as well. I said, you're just trying to brainwash me. And they said, uh, Lewis, your best thinking, your absolute best thinking, has put you into prison and now into rehab. Maybe your brain needs a good wash. <laughs> that is powerful, isn't it? I thought. I thought, I thought you bitch, but I thought she, she shut me up. I was, I was like, oh. And then I realized my way wasn't working. No matter how much I tried to tell myself I knew best and blah, 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 my way did not work because I'm fucking 25, 26 years old right now, sitting in a rehab of one of the youngest there, 40, 50 year old cracking heroin addicts. And I'm the youngest person there thinking that I'm fucking this big bollocks when really I'm, I'm fucked, I fucked mm. myself up. So I started doing their stuff. I started doing journaling, gratitude, and morning affirmations. They'd take us into a room, and you'll love this part. Morning affirmations every single day at 9 a.m. They had a room for it. You'd sit in a circle, you'd pass your piece of paper, and you'd say, I am statements. I am happy. I am powerful. I am strong. I am brave. And they'd say back to you, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And when you said the I'm happy one, it would like trigger a song and they'd all start singing. I'm H-A-P-P-Y. I'm H-A-P-P-Y. Oh, I know who I am. I'm sure it I kind am. Of makes I'm you H-A-P-P-Y. Happy, it it does. Kind of well, here's the thing. I thought, what's this fucking bollocks? What have I signed myself up for? It Walked makes... out and I was like, I'm kind feeling of great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. That kind of picked me up a bit. First of all, I was like, sharp. That's well. I'm not, not even going to say it. You're not allowed to say that anymore. No. But it's... Mm, yeah. But then I was like... 
Oh, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. And if you do that every day for months, your, your neighbours think happy. you're a fucking nut. Well, you are. So. <laughs> but yeah, no, but it, it, so yeah, so you started realising that this stuff was well, working. Yeah, yeah. So after the, the treatment centre, I had another option. Do I go back home? I thought, no. Because so, I've already realised that that's not for me and the growth that I'm getting is not worth risking. So I applied for employment support allowance, which is like dull. And I applied for housing benefit. And I got this shit old apartment and it was literally to get to my flat I had to step over heroin addicts that had passed out like it was horrible but it was my own place and that's how i started in portsmouth so i re re relocated yeah. to portsmouth and um and then eventually was allowed to do permitted earnings which is like 16 hours a week of work because they had to like gradually integrate me into society it wasn't even allowed to work straight away mm -hmm. in case i just fucked everything up and then i applied for college I yeah did an access course and then i eventually got into uni and then after three months, I realized that I, I wasn't learning as much as I thought. I didn't, you know, really enjoy it. And at the same time, I'd been reaching out to people and I'd been helping them for free. I'd been meeting them in Costa Coffee and just sharing what I'd learned with them in rehab. People that were like moaning online. So people would be depressed and moaning or moaning about their partner. I'd say, let's go for a coffee. And I'd share all this stuff for free and I would fucking change their life. And... After a while, I thought, hang on a minute, I could I could charge for this. And I didn't even know what a life coach was at this point. I was calling myself a personal development mentor. And I was just using my own experiences to like, when they were saying something, I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember going through that. Or I remember that in rehab. I remember that person that had that in rehab. Because when I'm in rehab, I'm not just learning from my own experiences, but it's a group of people, you know, and I'm learning their relapses, their denials, their breakthroughs, their stories, their triggers, their limiting beliefs. And I also did Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous for months. I did 30, uh, 90 meetings in 90 days. Mm. Some days I did five meetings, become obsessed with it. Like I was doing, learning back to back. <laughs> I was addicted to NA meetings, literally. I'd start off at one at 9 a.m. and sometimes I'd finish one at 9 p.m. Fucking and then I'd go for pancakes with them after. Um, but yeah, I'd learned so much and I was sharing that with people and it, it filled, filled another void. You know, these voids yeah. that I'd been looking for. I was like, oh, you're, you're, you're giving me praise for helping you change your life. That makes me feel good. You know, I don't know whether or not it was the empathy and of actually helping or if it was the significance I was getting and the yeah, power yeah. from being able to help them. Purpose. It's a little bit different, yeah. Mm. My brain's wired up a little bit differently, but I, de I definitely know it was a constructive way of channeling that. And so I thought, oh, I could go and do this. So I did some online qualifications, started to study more, started to read loads of books, and then become a life coach. And within seven months, I'd made 100 grand. And I was like, oh, my God. So the benefits dropped, and you know, I moved into a nice place. And I was like, wow, I could actually do this properly. And then, yeah, to cut a long story short, um, partnered up with a guy who was training uh, life coaches, but in the real world, called Liam. He was like, he had also been for a load of shit. So his dad committed suicide and stepped in front of a train. He was in the London terror attacks. He was also sexually abused, but he was also my age, my exact age, covered in tattoos as well, not covered, but tattoos, and was another geezer who was a life coach. And seven, eight years ago, there weren't coaches like that. There's quite a lot of them nowadays, but back then it was your 45 to 55 year old woman, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, so we were quite different, but we resonated with each other and we put the businesses together. So he would train coaches and I would then um, help with the business strategy because obviously I grew my business fast. And then we provided this end-to-end -end solution to help coaches, help people become coaches and then build their business online. So we had people traveling all over the world and making money and things like that. And then the business just grew. And that's pretty much the story of how we got to three years later a valuation of 25 million dollars just because we just had so much value to offer the courses blew fucking people's minds it was a viable business opportunity it happened during the pandemic as well pandemic obviously you know blew a load of awareness around it because everyone was looking for this online new thing and we had the perfect thing you get to help people you get to make money you get to do it from anywhere in the world and you can do our course and bang you're in fucking hell and um yeah then i started speaking on stages and tedx and opportunities and things started coming and I moved to Bali lived in Bali for three years Mad. met my um now wife whilst I was speaking on stage in Barcelona she was in the audience so she was a customer first mm. wow <laughs> and then uh she's a student first and then um yeah how many people have taken your course 7,000 Seven. from 85 countries around the world 
and what's that look like in revenue in total? Uh, 10 million. Fucking hell, that's crazy. So you're a multi-millionaire? Yeah, wow. in assets. Yeah, I wouldn't say in cash, but... Wow. That's that's that that's pretty insane, isn't it? But what what do you what do you what do you what do you give that to? I mean, f- just just changing the direction of your obsessive compulsive behaviour. Yeah. Um. The more well, something that Liam says is the more value you add to someone's life, the more money you make. And because I'd had to go to those depths, I had to learn so fucking much about how to get out. You know, I, I was lost in a maze, and I managed to figure out every fucking channel of that maze. And then I was able to help people with pretty much anything. I know that sounds quite egotistical, but you'd be surprised at how common a lot of people's issues are. Mm. The circumstances might be a little bit different, but the deep-rooted cause of it all is very much the same. So once you learn to deal with a few scenarios, you can deal with most. Um, and I start changing people's lives. And if you can change people's lives, you're solving a big problem. And business is all about solving problems. And the, the more bigger the problem you solve, and the, you know, the better the solution you provide, and the more impactful it is, the more successful you're going to become you know i'm literally helping people change their life first then go out and change other people's lives so they get fulfillment then earn money from it and then being able to travel wherever they want in the world working on their laptop so it's obviously just a no-brainer when you've got a no-brainer opportunity you're going to be successful plus i've also had this very logical strategic brain because i'm like if you're blind you can see better. That's no, 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 you can't. You can hear better. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So because I'm quite low on the emotional spectrum, I do have emotions. Like I can feel a bit, but it's just not as much. So my logical brain is is way more in the forefront. Mm. So I can see strategy literally mapped out in front of me in my head. And the, the emotions or the things that would usually hold people back just aren't there. Mm. You know, the fear, yeah. the, the fear of rejection or embarrassment or... Or being emotionally attached to business ideas or concepts that go wrong, you know? Yeah. I'm sorry, oh, whatever, change it, tweak yeah, it, yeah, yeah, move forward. Yeah. 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 So it's just been, you know, I think most people could have this form of success, but they aren't able to take the steps they only need to take because A, they can't see them because they're clouded by all yeah. the, the, the emotions. And also... Um, mm. Yeah, they can't. They, so they can't see the strategy at all. Yeah. And also, even if they can see the strategy, the emotions are holding them back. But if mm. the emotions aren't there, then I just have a set of steps that I need to follow, and I just literally go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and every day, every week, every month, I'm just growing, yeah. and I'm making more money, and I'm making more impact, and I'm living a, and a better life. And it's yeah. just like before, I used to say things were spiraling out of control because my mind was creating this perpetual cycle of doing the same things and getting the same result and it getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. But if you can change your mind um, so that you're doing the right things, then you spiral into control. And that's not an expression you hear often, no. but my life spiraled into control. I kept on going, fucking hell, how did I get clean and sober? Fucking hell, how did I get all the money? How did I travel the world? How did I create a community that's fucking making the world a better place? It's like, how is this happening so quick? And it's because everything slots into place and when there's nothing holding you back anymore, yeah. all you've got to do, is, it's like a catapult. You know, mm. you've been held back so long. And something that Dr. John D. Martini says, which I, I quote on every single podcast, I think even your, yours, is probably one of the most profound sayings I've ever heard just because it just summarizes everything I've said, is this, voids create values. So if you, if you haven't had something when you're growing up, you will create the opposing value and you will go and seek that thing. So I was because I didn't have that love from my dad, I was seeking it in all these areas and I was seeking it in the wrong areas, you know, in attention, in crime, in violence, in substances. But the moment that I found a value that could fill that void, that was constructive, that was helpful, I've, I'm now compelled to seek that value. And that's now my highest value, whatever that is, whether that's significance or love. Um, wow. It's yeah. just, it, I can't help but like desperately you know chase it you know yeah. and i think that's another thing you know like that's that catapult effect you know it's it, i didn't get it but now i you know want it so hard and i'm getting it so it's just i'm it's flinging me to the sky yeah oh so such a story man are you nervous about this all coming out on uh on this big oh. documentary you're not nervous no don't get that mm, i'm wow <laughs> you're fucking lucky man <laughs> yeah have you got kids no but just to add one extra trauma to the list unfortunately um Two years ago, my partner was pregnant and then 20 weeks into the scan, did a scan and then found out there's fluid around her brain. Mm, and oh. um, we had to give birth 20, uh, 25 weeks to a stillborn. 
I'm that sorry. Was like I'm huge. so, so sorry. But saying that, now pregnant again and she's due to give birth in two and a half weeks. Oh, hey, I love that. Leave that on a positive note. I love that. And there's going to be an entirely different set of parenting done to this yeah, child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't be beating him up. Yeah. And uh, Do you know if it's a boy? Or? It's a boy, yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. Well, and the other and, and, and Mia was a girl. So it's interesting how, how you know, life happen. has played out. Yeah. Well, look, um, a couple of things. I think, like, what a story. I really respect and appreciate your honesty. Um, I just want to quickly speak to that. For anyone that might still be a bit triggered by what I said or might be thinking, you know, wow, that was... I don't like this guy for what he said. I just want people to know I'm not proud of what I did, you know. Mm. I'm honest about the way that I felt about things. And I I can look back logically uh, in hindsight and, and, and... regret the things that happened to those people and wish they never happened to those people but I've also got to understand that that was a part of my journey and I didn't know any better Mm. and all I can do now is do better moving forward and 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 help other people and make sure I make my amends in that way yeah and not and not lie and pretend and and falsify my feelings because Mm. that would be you know inauthentic to do that yeah i am i you know we're all about neurodivergence now aren't we adhd dyslexia all these things my brain is diverse it's different it is you know i do think i am on that spectrum of that antisocial personality disorder whether that means i'm a full labeled psychopath is a label when it's not actually a clinical term it's the antisocial personality disorder which is actually a mental health condition i'd say i probably do have that and i do have traits of that Mm. And that has impaired me throughout my life, and they are still present today. Um, so I just like the people to take that into consideration when they, they yeah. make their judgment on me. But um, but I, by no means am I glamorizing or mm. uh, endorsing any type of violence or any type of behavior because you know it, I was in a bad place. Yeah, and the way we talk about things when it's our own story, when when me and you are in a conversation like this, we feel like it's only me and you in the room, right? Mm. I've, I've got a really sort of put this point across because I get a lot of criticism as well for things I say, you know, terms that were used that, you know, terms about, you know, if, uh, you, like you said, you know, I had to step over heroin addicts and stuff. Like that. And yeah, some yeah. people, some people might go, well, heroin addicts are, you know, I had a heroin addict on here before, but, you know, there's no malice in, in the terms and stuff we use because we're having a conversation yeah. and it's just, you know, there's not never any malice in the in the in the ways that we're talking. And also, there was an element of this is a podcast. You, you you know, we don't want it to be too dark and gloomy, and yeah. I don't want to sit here and tell you this tale of my traumas. And yeah. you know, so there's a certain element of blasé. Yeah, that yeah, you yeah. Have yeah that's to bring what I meant. That's what I meant. The blasé, the blasé to when you're storytelling, because you can get wrapped up in the story. But I think that the very the very essence of your story is is one of my own as well. Not as not not um, as. You're a psycho as well. No, not as well, <laughs> probably. But you know, if there's levels of it, I'm like, I'll kick shit over every now and then. But um, no, but what I mean is, the, the the bones of your story is is very similar to a lot of people's. It's certainly similar to mine. Where uh, and it's and it's at a point where a lot of people may find themselves now, where everything's going wrong, or they're not making the right decisions, and they're trying to find the answers, and they're trying to change. And I think the key thing that this podcast is about, and what your story is about, is. Um, that if you stop and look at yourself, you know what I mean? Like you said, you wasn't getting it right. If you stop and look at yourself, you find the tools, you can completely change your mm-hmm. life at any point. And I thought it was really interesting that you said that you, at one point you had to go, oh, this is happening, This how's it all happening so quick and things started happening fast. Well, the truth is, you had to put fucking years and years of working on yourself, right? Mm-hmm. You had to put years of working on yourself. And I think the most important thing that the uh, young lads especially, but uh, kids are, are, are lacking or, or stuff that we could implement into our children is the knowledge of personal development, is the knowledge of well-being, is the knowledge, you know, if you knew the things that you learned when you got on your journey to find yourself, if you knew them when you was a young, young boy, Things would be very different. Yeah. Things or if my parents knew them and they were able to teach them to yeah. me, that'd be even better. Exactly. And like, this is the, I mean, the last 10 months for me has been the most beautiful, in, in, hard, but in respects to, you know, going, right, so if I do these things that people are telling me are going to make me feel better and I just listen to people that know for a minute mm. and just hand it over to them mm. and then you start learning them and taking them on board and then you're like, oh my God, I'm actually starting to feel better. Mm. Then you can shift your addictive personality to being into addicted to all this negative shit and shift it 
into being addicted to this and then suddenly you become <laughs> obsessed with business and yeah. you make fucking 10 million pounds and to be honest there'll be a podcast that i do in a couple of years time where i'll realize that even that wasn't productive and that you know yeah. that was still chasing and i know that i'm still on my journey like i have got a long yeah. way to go like i'm yeah. nowhere near fixed mm. and i'm nowhere near changed i'm changing yeah i'm rehabilitating i'm evolving yeah. but it's a you know it's a bit of a cliche but it's a journey isn't it yeah. it's not a destination you don't just get there no no there's no. always going to be no. more layers and there'll yeah. be a point where i'll go do you know what i, I I've made fucking 500 million yeah. and uh, maybe it's time to stop working 14 hours a day yeah. and ignoring the message. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you and I think entrepreneurs, especially I consider myself a bit of an entrepreneur because I've got a variety of, of different businesses but one thing, like it's a constant, like with business, constantly analysing what you're doing, streamlining it, trying to find different ways of generating revenue or if it's the best. Like for me, for instance, my traditional uh, think and th thought process of business was, you know, I want a nightclub and then I worked out really quickly that there's only a certain amount of fucking nights of the week. There's only a certain amount of people I can get in there. There's only a certain amount of... of Cocaine alcohol, you can sell on the Yeah, side. or whatever that they're going to drink. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? This was back when I was fucking yeah. drinking and, and um, now I've turned it into a comedy club anyway because I can't fucking promote the drinking and that. I just don't feel happy mm. doing it. But... Um, the, the, but, but from a business perspective, I realised... Then I realised, well, fucking hell, if I put as much effort into that as something online that has no fucking... That has no ceiling, mm -hmm. right? That there's, no, you know, and then my, my 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 mind was blown. I was like, "Oh right, okay, you need to start focusing on where there's no limit to revenue, yeah. where there's no limit." And then it opened, but that was a natural sort of progression. But under no circumstances would my my thought process be able to change if I was still consumed with alcohol, drugs. Do you know what I mean? You have to be in a positive, like for you to see, like you said, you had a logical brain. I'm going on now a little bit, we'll finish up, but for you to say you had a logical brain and you could see those patterns within business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I do this and do this and do this and do this, so actually we can scale it up like this. Mm -hmm. You don't see shit like that when you're fogged with come downs, hangovers, no, 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 no. and you're stressed. And you don't want to do it yeah, as well. And you're stressed about dumb shit in life. Yeah. Wow, what a fucking journey, man. Thank you, um, forever me. Yeah, and guys, remember you saw him here first. You're soon going to see him out there. And uh, this is this is your camera here. Just tell them where they can find you online. I've just realised I've been looking fat this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Um, so you can find me on any social media platform, but mainly Instagram at at Lewis Raymond Taylor. And you can come and check out the Coaching Masters if you're interested in becoming a life coach and do what I do at thecoachingmasters.com. But yeah, you will see me on one of your favourite streaming platforms on a documentary of my life real soon to so check that out. Cool, man. Lewis, thank you. Thank you. I knew that was going to be good. Cheers, mate. It's been a pleasure. But it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Menace to Sobriety. Uh, we had a real life psycho in the room. That was that was some scary shit. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Um, and um, listen, sharing is caring. Go and check out Lewis. Go and follow him and uh, leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought. Uh, give us your feedback and uh, tell someone about the podcast. But thank you very much. That was Menace to Sobriety. I'm out. Bye bye for now. Hello! We are going to take the Menace to Sobriety to the live stage and we need a live studio audience to interact with us, to come along, listen, laugh and learn everything about sobriety, mental health, well-being and just come along for a night out with like-minded people. We are going to be going live on the 30th of August, 27th of September, 25th of October and the 29th of November. That's one a month. Get your tickets now. Come down, meet the team and have some fun. Menace to Sobriety live, coming soon. Oh yes, and don't forget, if you want to come and see me live and meet me, I'm going on tour. The Daniel O'Reilly Out of Character Full UK Tour kicks off in January 2024 and tickets are on sale right now. I'm going to try and get out and meet as many of you as possible. And of course, I'm going to be bringing the laughs all over the UK. There's 23 dates right now and I'm adding more all the time. Hit the link in the bio and get your tickets now and come have some fun. If you're going through a tough time at the moment, please don't suffer in silence. Feel free to pick up the phone and contact any of these helplines. I personally, myself, at one of my darkest points, contacted the Samaritans and it completely changed my outlook and got me out of a really deep, dark place. A problem shared really is a problem halved. So if you don't feel confident talking to those around you, check out any of these organizations and give them a call. This is my Facebook group, just simply search on Facebook, Men and Their Emotions. It's for men only, uh, but once you're in there, you can talk anonymously about your problems and help others and just feel a little bit of community. So come join the conversation, Men and Their Emotions, on Facebook.
Thanks for watching. Menace of sobriety. Just a minute.